Morning, everyone. Um, oh, it's recording. Pressure's on. Okay. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Good evening. So I'm I'm Jake uh, on the left hand side here, the handsome one, and this is my colleague Richard on the right here. Um, two two of the fishery management advisors with the Angling Trust, funded by Rod License Money. Um, <clears throat> uh, I, I live in Coventry. Richard lives up in the northwest, uh, so I sort of cover the south and Richard the north. Um, tonight we're going to look at the techniques. Uh, to reduce the impact of predation by pisky birds um, with sort of special sort of focus on cormorants this evening. So here's a quick overview of our role. Uh, we're here to help improve um, refuge for fish in times of predation, help fisheries with modern effective non-lethal scaring tactics, um, assist with individual and also area-based cormorant licenses, um, also look at, through those area licenses, monitoring bird numbers and evidence in the impacts of predation. And then uh, sort of, I suppose, the other half of our role is helping fisheries um, um, against, you know, uh, predation by otters, particularly still waters and fencing and funding. And then also both of us uh, on the CL36 license to trap and remove otters from within, uh, within fence fisheries. So today we're going to talk about these uh, cormorants. Um, and firstly, we're just going to have a quick look at, I suppose, the, the huge variety of things that can impact uh, fish stocks, whether that's an increase in fish stocks or as we're looking at today, predation, which is part of decreasing fish stocks um, with pisky birds there at the bottom left. Just just, you know, just part of that, of, of things that can happen alongside, you know, pollution, natural mortality. Um, but then there are other sides to that as well. And I suppose that sometimes, um, you know, angling um, can switch off and, and fish can um, almost go missing in times of predation and actually sometimes that could be down to behavioural changes and actually during the daytime um, when cormorants are coming into feed they're going into hiding. So what we'd always recommend is a, is a stock assessment of that so I suppose the first port of call would be a fisheries technical officer from the Environment Agency um, but then obviously there's a, a number of um, sort of pri private companies that will come in and do that for you to actually look at what's going on. So cormorants, a couple of nice pictures here just to get you in the mood here. This is Blashford Lake down on the Hampshire Avon Valley and a cormorant quite easily taken down a pipe there, probably three or four pounds, struggle to take off there. Uh, another common sight that we see, I suppose, you'll come to the gate and uh, open the gate and you'll see a few birds taken off from maybe the still water. You'll come down and this was a site down in, down in Devon where a couple of cormorants had regurgitated, just two, two birds had regurgitated um, some of these fish uh, as they take because they couldn't take off and they regurgitated these sort of skimmers up um, to, 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 uh, to take off and fly away. So I suppose a little bit of background and just to understand what we're talking about, talking about the great cormorant, uh, Phalacocorax carbo, um, and there are, it's, I think it's key to understand the two, the two subspecies of, these, of, of, of this species of bird. So you have the Phalacocorax carbo carbo, which is our native seabird, um, which gradually from the 80s um, has, has taken up residence inland, so started to feed and then sort of breed in, um, inland uh, still waters and, and rivers. And also the Carbo sinensis bird, which is the European um, freshwater cormorant. Um, to the sort of naked eye from a distance, you wouldn't particularly sort of notice the difference, but this is a freshwater bird that has, has bred in Northern Europe and at the same time as the Carbo Carbo has increased in, in size and also its spread. And now we, we have migratory birds that come in over winter here in the UK every winter. And some of those birds have remained. So we have a mixed breeding um, sort of population throughout the uh, UK. So you can see here spread. This is going back a few years. There's a few, few more dots on this map now. But these are the inland breeding colonies here. Um, so I live yeah, in the centre of England, Coventry. We have one near me at Coombe Abbey. But you can see quite a lot of sort of large spread of these. Um, and as well as the coastal sort of breeding uh, populations as well, you know, there's quite a lot of pressure then um, throughout the year on fisheries of cormorants coming into feed. So these are the two birds, these here. Um, the real major difference is the angle on the, on the gular pouch here, um, which is the sort of red, <clears throat> red, orange and yellow uh, pouch at the base of the beak here when they're um, sw swallowing fish down. Okay, so when looking at sort of options that are available, there's many factors to consider uh, on each fishery. So 
is, is the site uh, designated for any reason? Are there, uh, are there other notable species that have protection on there? Um, so that would be with Natural England. So whether it's a triple SI or an SPA, um, so obviously other, other species that you wouldn't want to disturb on there. Proximity to conurbation and public rights of way, uh, particularly when talking about shooting, um, obviously a very emotive subject um, and also the health and safety aspect to it. The species of the fish present and their habits, so what sort of species of fish you're looking to protect, sort of techniques you'd use with a, a trout fishery would be different to if you're protecting shellfish, such as roach and rudd. And also the habits and the characteristics of, of the birds that are using your water. So you can go you know, out into the countryside where birds are shot at um, under license and they're very jumpy and, and, and very cautious of, of human um, presence. You can go into the centre of London and you could be in a London park lake and the cormorants would be swimming right in front of you. So that, that would alter your sort of management of them. The size and the shape of the fishery. So, you know, a small, I suppose, sort of farm lake that you could maybe rope off over the winter would be, you know, you, that would be different to a huge, you know, 2000 acre trout fishery where you'd have to look at different techniques of just managing cormorant numbers and trying to keep the rates of predation down. Um, and then we've mentioned the other factors that obviously can affect uh, fish stocks that we need to consider to so overstocking, poor water quality, uh, invasive species such as signal crayfish. The human presence at site is key. Um, some of the techniques we'll talk about tonight are quite labour intensive. So whether that's that sort of regular scaring or say use of lasers that, you know, so if you've got somebody that either lives on site or patrols on a regular basis, that could be key to keeping birds off. And then the existing non-lethal methods and how well they've been employed. So quite often we'll hear that, you know, scare, we've tried scarecrows, we've tried bangers and all these, and, and none of them work, which, yeah, and, and there's an element of truth to that where birds will habituate. So it's about trying to get in uh, other techniques that will reinforce uh, the danger to birds on particular fishery. So the first thing that um, I think we both always recommend to fisheries, if they've not done so already, would be to set up some sort of monitoring or, or a cormorant logbook. Um, so this looks at a variety of things. So the numbers of birds visiting your fishery, their behavior, what they're doing, feeding, loafing, you've got roosting birds, even things like the flight paths and timings can help you with your, with your, with your management of those. You know, when you're gonna get down to scare and angles to set up sort of mannequins and where you're gonna position hides. Um, Photographs of any damaged fish can be brilliant. So if you're having a, uh, a survey done or you're having a match, any, any fish when you're, when you're going through them, any damage, photograph that. That's key evidence should you need to go down um, the, the licensing process or even for funding applications for refuge. Uh, and other things that can highlight sort of change over time and match records um, can give it an indication of, uh, of a decline in fish stocks. So here's quite a simple one. This is a fishery down in Kennet Valley, but yeah, just monitoring that every day. Uh, this this was this formed part of a, a, a license application, but it just gives the basic well, you know, what's been done. You can then go into a bit more detail. So this is this is what we sort of I suppose recommend to, to go alongside a, a license application, and that gives a bit more information about what's going on. Can seem a bit onerous, but actually getting into the swing of things, this can. This can really help you not only as evidence for a license application but it will also tell you you know if what you're doing you know uh, has any merit in it so you know what's working what's not working um and also looking at the timing so bird behavior is going to change depending on what you're doing so then you can uh, i suppose alter your um timings of what you're doing and then some clubs now set up uh, monitoring on their club websites so if you're out on the bank and you've got anglers out there on the bank every day, they can log in to your website, put the information in, and then you can pull that off and produce all the Excel spreadsheets and, and whatever you want to produce using that information. And what, why it can be really important on, on monitoring bird numbers, particularly the roosting sites that we keep an eye on, is that should you get a sudden influx, and this is Dungeness, the, the photograph is from last year, but yeah, this is Dungeness when I think four or 5,000 birds turned up. And the surrounding fisheries down there in the southeast are absolutely, absolutely walloped. Um, so sort of keeping tabs on that can give you the heads up on, you know, gearing up to protect your fish. This is one of those fisheries where birds were coming in. 
And looking at other roosting sites, so normally you pick them up in the day, you can see the trees that have been sort of bleached white with the guano um, and a few birds there. And you can go back then and sort of use thermal imaging and count those birds up and understand what is actually going on in that area and, and the levels of damage. And we can help you with that um, if you want to work that out. Um, I think what is clear, there's, there's, a, there's a handful of fisheries that, that can solve the problem with sort of one, one technique, but yeah, more often than not, there's, there's no silver bullet and it requires a, um, a variety of different techniques blended together uh, and use those proactively throughout the year. Um, so that could be, you know, a scaring regime using a variety of non-lethals on, on smaller waters, exclusion techniques, so ropes and, and wires. Um, fish stock management, so whether that would be increasing size of stock fish or netting fish out um, and then having them grow on in, in different ponds then to get them past the cormorant, um, cormorant sort of size meal and also in, increasing refuge for fish. So certainly over a, over a longer sort of time frame is looking to improve refuge for fish in times of predation and excluding cormorants from those areas. So looking at a scaling regime, um, and this is easy for me to say, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult job. But what I would say is certainly um, set up um, targeted shooting to scare. So about shooting to miss, um, obviously with landowner's consent and, and somebody with a shotgun certificate with considerations um, on, a, on a designated site. Um, potentially inform your local police team and also residents if you've got people there just to explain what you're doing to start off with, that you're keeping birds off the water to protect your fish. Um, I think it's key to enter the fishery before the birds arrive. You want to be there. So if the birds are coming in at first light, half an hour before first light set up, um, to scare them as they're coming in. So you don't want them to feed and then scare them because the damage has been done. They'll either regurgitate the fish or they'll take off with them inside. And I'd say that this wants to be regular and sustainable. So normally sort of cormorant predation peaks during the winter. So have that set up so you know you can get down there on a regular basis throughout that whole winter and not sort of burn out, I suppose. If possible, if you've got a, a, few, a few people working on the fish reel within a club, work on a rotor um, and, and work together. And then it's key to bring that through that log of action that I, I raised. So keep that, all of that information in there because that's, that's key information for you. Then alongside that, observing the bird behavior and then alter your timings then um, to reflect the changes in their behavior. And then what we'll touch on a bit later is using, you know, hides and mannequins to condition birds um, to forage elsewhere. So more often than not, you can't be down on a fishery every single day shooting to skirt. There's, you know, so many other things to be done. So using lifelike mannequins and hides to actually change their behaviour. So as they're flying in or around a fishery, you'll condition them to fear that, that that's that's the shooter. So. Lethal intervention. So cormorants are protected like, like all wild birds under the Wildlife and Countryside Act in 1981 and also the Wild Birds Directive. Um, but shooting to scare doesn't require any license from Natural England, obviously with uh, considerations for designated sites, but also during the breeding bird season as well, when you can't shoot. Um, but potentially on designated sites, you can shoot, shoot to scare and also shoot under licensed cormorants um obviously just making sure that any non-targets are not being disturbed um, and then there are licenses um that can be uh, issued by natural england for the lethal control of, of cormorants to enhance uh, scaring and nationally at the at present that's up to three thousand birds annually um, and annually there is a licensing period from the first of september through to the 15th of april um, that's there to to protect uh, breeding birds and leaving birds on nests there are, there are two extensions, two two-week extensions there to protect the smolt room for sea trout and salmon on various rivers. So that can be put in place. And as I said, these are here to enhance scaring and non-lethal techniques as opposed to a reduction of population. The licenses, you can apply for an individual license and this can actually cover three sites that are sort of close to each other. Um, or you can yeah, look to apply for or join an area-based license. And this could be a catchment or park catchment with, with sort of surrounding still waters, or if you're a club and you wanted to cover more than four waters, um, yeah, an area-based license might be something you want to look at. So on the shooting side of things, I think where I'm coming from, as opposed to the hunting side of things, would be to try and alter bird behavior. Um, 
to, to I suppose, help, help the fishery manager uh, in, in the long run. Cormorants have incredible vision and amazing accommodation and sight, so they can focus from a huge distance away. I suppose they're, they're, they've evolved to look for shellfish from a great height and look for silverfish turning. So that, that you know, their, their eyesight's, you know, extremely, you know, well adapted to understanding what's going on on the bank. And whilst cormorants don't know what anglers are, they certainly know the difference between someone who's sitting there with a the fishing rod and someone there with a the shotgun. So you can use that to your advantage. Um, so when it comes to scarecrows, and I, I love them, I've got hundreds of photos of all these wonderful different scarecrows that I've come across. This fella on the right ear is having a cheeky can and a cigarette, and he looks like he's having a great time, but I don't think they're posing much um, of a threat to a cormorant, and birds will habituate to these really quickly. Days, you know, um, you know may, may, maybe a few weeks, but, you know, before you know it, birds will be coming down and feeding in front of these. So mannequins want to look as sort of lifelike as possible with, with what you've got. Um, and they want to be sort of proactively move around a fishery. But what is key, and even ones that look like they've got guns, the birds will still get used to them, is that that element of shooting to scare, or if you've got a license, shooting to kill to enhance scaring from behind them, or using, you know, hides or a combination of mannequins and boats. Um, some sites you won't be able to shoot, and it's doing the best that you can uh, to try and replicate those bangs. So that might be rope bangers or a starter pistol or on some, you know, urban waters, even sort of two, two bits of wood that are slapped together um, can, can help. Um, it's about doing what you can. So rather than go through it, you know, and, and fail, you know, I'd, I'd start if possible with shooting to scare um, and, and see how you get on. So here's some of the a variety of non-lethal sort of techniques that are on the market. Um, yeah, I think what I would say is that the vast majority of these things that probably wouldn't scare cormorants off in the first instance, or they get used to them very quickly. Um, I think from, yeah, personal experience, gas can, can work very loud. Uh, you'll get complaints, but birds will sort of get used to them. I, I think starter pistols are a great tool, really good. You can carry them around, um, particularly sort of tr trusted bailiffs that um, don't have a shotgun certificate. And, and rope bangers can work uh, you know, fantastically as well. So looking at some exclusion tactics, this is a trout farm where you know it's not a problem to, to get those netted, um, where there's no obviously angling interest. And that's, you know, that should keep the majority of birds out. You'll still see herons trying to contort through those and, and cormorants tr trying to crash land on the bank, but that should do the job. Um, string lines, this is in the Cotswold Water Park. Not a fishery again this is a growing on lake but keeping the vast majority of birds off what birds were doing then was landing on the adjacent water hobbling out and then swimming into this one so that needed stock netting alongside that then to keep the birds off this is a fishery down the Colm valley um just try to do what they can do to to keep the birds off um they've got you know upstream and downstream two huge roosting sites and basically birds using the river uh, as a as a motorway going between the two um, and it's very tricky when you've got hundreds of birds coming and going pretty much all day to try and keep them off. Um, and I believe this has been updated now, so I should get down there to, to check that out. Yeah, this was one, this one down in Essex, one I uh, uh, found out about. And you can actually see if you look closely, you can see the lines there. And I actually thought that was just um, the computer screen. But actually, it's a, it's a series of high wires that, that cover the... The whole fishery so it might not be ideal or, or suited to, to many fisheries but they were they were getting so many so many birds coming in that this is the action they've taken they've put up scaffolding and, and high wires um which has completely stopped the cormorants from getting in and uh, and the day we were there we were seeing ducks and things sort of take off in between but it, it stopping the birds coming in so fairly extreme um but it did the job and it was one of those that fish fish weren't getting caught and, and then within a few weeks of these going up, actually fish began to get caught again. And it was that the, the fish were under stress, they were in, in hiding during the day. Um, so yeah, this worked here. Here's a small water down in, um, down in Dorset where they've you know, combined a, a variety of options here to keep the birds off. It's a small you know, part of the National Crucian Project, little tench inclusions in there, perfect for cormorants to come in and, uh, and eat up. So yeah, string lines here, particularly during the winter when the bird is raised and, and the monitor and 
some shooters on there for some pretty job. So stocking practice, I'll, yeah, I'll briefly mention that. I suppose it's common practice now for, for trout waters to stop sort of two, two and a half pound plus. Um, Cormorants will, will still have a go at those. They will still swallow those in, in some, but what you'll find is probably the rates of predation will drop. So you might get a higher incidence of damaged fish, but there's more fish left in the water. Um, and then obviously you've got, I suppose, when it comes down to mixed sort of still waters, is looking at maybe carp fisheries and silver fisheries and that, you know, are the cormorants coming in and, and doing a sort of cropping for, for those carp fisheries. Um, but I'd say, yeah, looking at bringing fish on um, to the right sort of size, but cormorants will, will still have a go at them. Um, but when it comes to stocking, I suppose timing's key. If you know that the cormorant numbers peak in November, probably don't stop then. Um, look to trickle stock or, or, or even, you know, vary the locations of stocking. So you haven't got all your fish sitting sitting in one location acclimatizing. Uh, and then a, a, a group of cormorants can come down and get them. So long, longer term habitat improvements, you know, reed beds, Planted in native tree species that offer all the sort of root structure um, into, into the margins. Sanctuary areas, so maybe leaving sort of certain areas out of bounds to angling and, or take a few pegs out and try to create areas that fish can move to in, in, in times of predation. Um, but I suppose left naturally, cormorants will still feed in these. And, you know, I've witnessed this numerous occasions where cormorants will be diving through tunnels in the weed or under floating reed beds and around lilies. Um, uh, so what I'll do is I'll talk about uh, sort of I suppose giving those up with some man-made ideas. But if you want to I suppose uh, sort of look into habitat improvements, if you're looking on small streams of wild trout trust, the Environment Agency they have the Fisheries Improvement Fund uh, as well as the Angling Improvement Fund, um, which will hopefully have, have more money available in April, and also the Institute of Fisheries Management, which offer a variety of sort of training options. But particularly what I've been to a few of the weekend still water management courses that they're, they're yeah, really popular. Um, so yeah, this is this is at Coombe Abbey. This is a big massive floating reed bed. And the cormorants, you still get 30 cormorants coming in here and swimming amongst the reeds and underneath it. Um, and along the lilies here. So what I like, I saw it I mean, about seven, eight years ago down in, uh, in Surrey somewhere. Um, and it was using chestnut paling as sort of underwater fencing the gaps between them sort of three inches perfect to let fish go through into these sort of sanctuary areas but to stop stop uh, cormorants coming in so there's a small water down you know, in uh, Somerset I think and the cormorants would all drive up work as a team three or four birds and push it push all the roach up to the end of this still water so so a bit of advice gave me yeah a bit of advice which was to rope off the actual lake to try and break up um, their sort of landing strip and, and, and area to take off as well so Potentially they could land in those gaps, but it's about their, um, their ability to take off, um, which I suppose stops them. And then right at the end would be to fence off um, the corner using that chestnut pelling underwater. So should the birds get in, they push the fish into, into these areas, but the, the birds couldn't follow. This is, this is the uh, Surrey still water, so Shillingly. They put a, a variety of refuges in, floating ones, um, these, these sort of submerged structures to try and break up sort of cormorant feeding patterns and offer refuge. I thought went quite well. So refuges, the three things uh, I think you're looking for, um, certainly overhead cover. So you're offering shade. Fish will naturally, uh, in terms of predation, move into those areas with, with overhead cover. And then any structure within that. So naturally they'd move into, I don't know, with, root sort of structures but you could mim you know you could mimic that with um with, with sort of brushwood or you know sort of frayed rope and things like that um and anything to offer those structures to get into um but then key is is to exclude cormorants from in there so that could be stock netting chestnut chestnut paling or, or or wire to keep those birds from actually following them into the refuge areas and i think that it's key to make the refuge areas significantly bigger than, than what you normally see on a fishery. Um, you know, the larger, the better, I, I would say. Um, and I really like the idea of sort of combining floating islands with, with these sort of fenced off areas and creating basically big, big sort of reefs where fish can get into um, and, 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 and escape predation. The location of these can be, uh, can be key. So looking at areas of 
natural, I don't know, winter migration. So, you know, where's the roach move in the winter to, to a, a particular area? So off, you know, put, put your refuges there or even areas where the birds push them to. Uh, and also key to, to keep, you know, to keep these planted up. So you'll see a lot put in and then a few years down the line, they just look like litter or they look a bit like shopping trolleys sitting in the water. Um, there's a couple of great videos on YouTube uh, and the East from the Environment Agency um, with some nice sort of cheaper options that clubs can do. It shows you the materials to get and how to build them. Um, and they can be brilliant for getting in, particularly at sort of short notice. Um, and then looking at the bottom photo is, yeah, don't just stick them out there and, and have them as an area for cormorants to sit on because if anglers are sitting around the lake and they're not catching and there's 40 cormorants sitting out there that have all fed, uh, sitting there in front of anglers, it's, it's got to cause um, some friction. So there's those birds sitting there. And yet, yeah, see lots of homemade ideas, which I think are great, you know, recycling materials. These are refuges down um, small still waters at the middle of wrecks. Brilliant idea, offers all that sanctuary we've talked about, cover, uh, areas to get into, stops the birds getting in there. So yeah, anything like that can work really well. These are the cheap and cheerful ones. You know, put these in, how well did they do? I'm not too sure. The still water we put them in was a, a monster. We ended up putting about 20, 25 of these in. Um, but marked up with boys here, so we knew how to go and retrieve them and also to, to stop anglers. Uh, and the flag anglers sort of bait boating their dead baits out to them so they weren't going to pose a snag risk. Gold spikes are a nice little tool that can be used. So if you've got anything, I don't know, a floating pontoon out in your lake, or like we've got here, a trash trash uh, screen on the river tent, Trent, excuse me, I need a drink. Uh, these can work well in just, just preventing birds from loafing there. So yeah, they might still come in and have a feed, but they're not gonna come feed, digest the fish, feed again. Um, so it just keeps them on the move. Uh, so here's a little still water in Reading where you can see these old posts. So a cormorant's taken up, uh, sort of sit, sitting on each of these posts. And then you've got one of these old um, sort of floating islands that, that has seen better days. Um, so just something nice and simple, like take those posts out so the cormorants can't loaf there all day. Uh, mm -hmm. And then maybe look at, up, you know, get, getting some matting on this and getting some plants growing in into your, uh, into your fish refuge. So there's a, some uh, some work that can be done on roosts. You might you normally you'll find roosts on, on islands on still waters, and and also breeding colonies, and sometimes alongside rivers. And but normally out the way, quieter areas where, where the birds um, can sort of I suppose have a good look around and see. But then yeah, they're, they're, they're undisturbed. Um, and you can see these aren't the same island, but this one on the left is in Northampton. But birds were using the dead branches. And they could, you know, see there was no threat and they were just dropping into the lake and, 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 and feeding. But over time, if it's, you know, a suitable site, bird numbers will increase. Potentially, they'll start to breed there. Uh, and then you might get this sort of scenario. This is Walthamstow Reservoir on the right hand side, where that, that used to be one of the largest heronries um, in the UK. Um, the herons were displaced by the cormorants. Um, and then over time, the, the trees have died, the soil structures changed. The island is, you know, it, other than cormorants roosting there, doesn't sort of, I don't suppose, pose any sort of benefit uh, to other wild wildlife. Um, that's it in the winter. It's, yeah, quite remarkable. Uh, and you might find they'll also, yeah, this is down on the River X. I mean, there's not much that can be done. There's no roost modification that you can do on here. So, yeah, but... um. But potentially, you know, something like lasers could work on, on this site. Um, lasers are a brilliant tool, but, but I'd say just in the right circumstance. Um, and there are now some brilliant lasers that you can use. So sort of Portec, like a, a really good one for about 300 pounds. Um, and then the larger Agri laser. Um, and they're sort of used for on, on airports for, for, to prevent bird strike. You can get smaller ones, but they can, they can be hit, hit and miss. So you can get some brilliant laser pens for, for cheaper options. But, um, I, you know, I, what I would do is recommend getting one um, from one of these trusted companies. Um, so the laser is a, a brilliant tool used on particularly on roosting birds. So as the light's fading and the birds are gathering to roost on, on say, these, these large islands, um, the laser is used by flicking it across 
the bird's body and, and they really don't like it and and they appear not to habituate to it i've used them for a few years now um you've got to be very careful with them so you need a, a safe backdrop um misuse of lasers is is you know a, a serious offense and i think people have, have been jailed um using them uh, inappropriately but yeah brilliant uh using them in lower light to, to clear birds off it's target selective and totally silent so you can shine it across a water body onto an island and you could you know leave all the overwintering ducks completely undisturbed um but you can just pick up those cormorants and keep them on the move so it's it's something that requires repetition um so to start with it might take five or six attempts to clear them off and they'll come off the roost and fly around and come back and you keep doing that and eventually over you know not 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 too long a time you'll condition those birds so as soon as they actually see you with the laser and it comes on they'll 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 disappear off to another site and whilst that's moving them on it's keeping them off the area where you know you've got fish in there um that have been predated on it's putting them onto another area where there potentially isn't an angling interest so yeah this is coom so i'd drive up walk across the car park to the field shine it on them and they'd circle and eventually I'd, I'd move them off to an, to another nature reserve where there's no angling on there. Um, and it kept birds down from, you know, 120 plus, down, down just to a, a handful. So, short video. So you, you can't see the laser on this. This is a thermal video. Um, and what I'll be doing now is sort of shining the laser across to the birds. But what you'll see is, this is, uh, this is dark now, but what you'll see is the birds, uh, disturbed and then all sort of come up, come out of the trees hopefully <clears throat> and then this is another water just trialing this on a, a large still water um and even counting the birds there, you know, you'd probably say there's 40. Um, you see them start to come out the trees and you realize how many there are actually there. Um, and they're coming off the left. It pauses just to recalibrate. And there's, yeah, 70, I think there was 70, 80 birds coming off there. Um, and done, done over time, this can reduce rates of predation on not only this still water, but those surrounded still waters. And worked in conjunction with other things, whether that's sort of shooting on neighbouring waters and uh, and other scare tactics, uh, can have a good impact. This is used in the day. They can be used on still waters. Um, they don't like that. That will keep them off. So you know, waters where potentially range range is an issue with shooting, lasers can be a, a great tool um, to help you. Okay, so yeah, I've probably talked enough. I'm about to lose my voice. So if, yeah, if you'd like to, if you'd like to find out more, if you'd like some advice, um, you know, we offer advice over the telephone, email, or, or come and do a site visit and, and help you out on the bank. Um, so yeah, here's our details: Richard there on the left and one on the right hand side. Um, so thanks for listening, and I think we'll see if we've got any questions coming. I shall let Richard answer those. <laughs>